American issues take two. Violence is on the rise in America. That's not a question, you know. In, in another context, we might frame that as a question. It's a fact. That's what's going on. Today, we're going to talk about violence and, and the rise of violence in America. Um, what is the connection between, um, you know, the, um, the dog whistles uh, and, the, and the, all the claims made by uh, extremists that uh, we are in a civil war? Is this what a civil war looks like? Is it a combination of lone wolf attacks? Um, it's not in the street. It's, uh, you know, in the supermarkets and synagogues and elementary schools. Is that the civil war? Anyway, uh, Tim Apatel is going to help us with that. And so is Manfred Henningsen and our dear friend Vicky Caetano and our, uh, what am I going to say, our regular contributor, uh, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. Uh, thank you for coming, all you guys. Welcome to the show. Uh, Tim, let's begin with you. Um, we stumbled into an article about stochasticism. And uh, stochasticism refers to the dog whistle process. Um, and we have an article to look at. I uh, wonder your thoughts about what it means and where it fits in this discussion. Oh, good morning, Jay. Um, yeah, this article from Kurt Braddock, who is um, a professor in speech communication. Um, I've never heard the term stochastic uh, terror or stochastic violence. So that's a new term to me. And you know, in the article that he, he put out was, um, it's not a direct call to violence, but it's an applied demonization of perhaps a political enemy or, or an individual. Um, I'll give you an example. When Donald Trump said that, that all people in the media were enemies of the people or enemies of the state. So it's not a direct um, pointing the finger at any one individual, but it's implied um, kind of dangling um, threats and demonization, which, you know, when you have a population of 330 million, you may have one or two people of that population to actually act upon it and, and act upon someone's words of demonization. So that's the best way I could try to describe uh, so, so stochastic terror. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that the definition of it um, um, actually, uh, it's 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 imprecise in the sense that you don't know who you're going to reach. You don't know that you're going to get Joe Dokes to go out and shoot up a, a, a massage parlor. You don't know uh, what the effect is going to be, but you do know that somebody will react. And although that is not an American jurisprudence right now, I don't think there's been a lot of cases, uh, you know, finding that connection. I think if we keep on having this experience, we're going to have to think about changing American jurisprudence. Um, Jay, let me just that. jump in because you know the Supreme Court case of 1968, Brandenburg versus Ohio, they basically overturned a conviction of a Ku Klux Klan guy because um, the the incitement wasn't uh, imminent and it wasn't directional. It didn't have an action that followed up on it, and so that that Supreme Court case kind of uh, as you adequately said before the show is that the dog whistle was not tied to the dog. Yeah. Uh, Manfred, what about the First Amendment? Doesn't that protect uh, anybody who does a dog whistle? You know, when um, uh, Donald Trump said, we have to go in there, we have to, we, you know, we have to, we have to go into the uh, Capitol building, we got to save our country, which is, you know, complete lie. Um, and uh, we, we got to be mad as hell and we got to fight, take our country back, all that. Um, was he sending a dog whistle? And was that dog whistle protected by the First Amendment? Look, I think <clears throat> the First Amendment doesn't mean that uh, democracy is a suicide contract. Uh, so for that reason, I think uh, we should uh, focus on uh, the, f the fact that this kind of rhetorical violence, you have not only in the US, you have in other Western societies. What makes the US different is the Second Amendment. And the madness of the Second Amendment, uh, together with uh, you know, the freedom of speech and the First Amendment makes all the, the difference. It's, I find, it, I mean, the, the longer I watch you know, American news about these violent explosions, I am really surprised about the madness of the of people not reacting politically to it. You know, the Second Amendment is the dumbest thing. Uh, well, there are a lot of other dumb things in the Constitution, but this is the dumbest. The Electoral College is the second dumb. 
uh, institution in the constitution. But I do, look, I feel a little bit more optimistic about this country since the midterms. We talked about it the last time. I think uh, the Americans- yes, We've not, had a number of attacks since I, the midterms. I know, but look, the difference is that uh, you have the second amendment, people can get guns. You have a lot of violent rhetoric in Britain, in Germany, in France, in Scandinavia, especially in Scandinavia. You have now a neo-fascist uh, prime minister. Well, you know, we thought, we thought that that violent rhetoric wasn't going to go anywhere. If you remember the early days of Trump. Yeah, but you know, it goes somewhere because you have the second amendment. it does amendment. go somewhere. Yeah. It goes somewhere yes. because you have second amendment. Yes. You, get, you can get guns. You Let don't get it in Vicky. other countries. Vicky, do you feel safer these days? Do you think we should feel safe even here in Hawaii? Um, it seems to me that um, you know our lives um, are at the margins. Um, they are uh, they are festooned with violent possibilities. No? Absolutely. You know, if you look at how many people have died, the number of deaths between 2014 that you sent me that information until 2020, it's just appalling. And, and while these do make the headlines, I don't think it's all attributed just to this. There's no question that having Donald Trump as president in sense, so many people created such an atmosphere of, to me, uh, the ability, the liberty to go out and, and do what happened on January 6th, trying to justify it. You know, everybody points to the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, but we have to remember that when our founding fathers wrote those words, I don't think they could have envisioned the country as it is today. And I think people need to translate and interpret things carefully given the situation that we are in now. So no question about that. But I think you also have to look at, you know, other issues such as, you know, domestic violence, uh, crime. Oh my gosh. I mean, look at how we treat crime today, right? How many repeat offenders before they're actually locked up for good? So there are multiple reasons creating a very violent society that we're in. But gun control or lack of in the United States of America is front and center to me of the, ca the number of casualties that we're seeing. No other country sees this. And we need to address gun control. It's Manfred's point, too. So, uh, Stephanie, um, you know, it seems to me that um, we're in a place um, where um, you may want to consider getting a gun. To protect yourself, and in fact, all over the South, you know, um, the the Republicans are telling te school teachers um, to go get guns, protect themselves. Um, so now you have a spiral up. Instead of having fewer guns, hey, you got more guns. Oh my God, does that make it better? Would you do that? You want to get one? Um, I mentioned once before that what I'm interested in is some kind of like Range Rover tank concoction vehicle. So uh, that would be my investment in a gun. OK, so but my, I think one thing we need to keep in mind is our heritage, in addition to the tremendous, great, miraculous one we have from the founding fathers, but we also have the opening of the country and the development of the West. That I'm looking at wagon train and ride. Well, how about all the Western and, uh, movies? We have hey, been exposed to, not to mention movies the and entertainment and, and art where, where, yeah. where guns are ubiquitous every exactly. moment. The number of okay, people but, being shot and killed in our entertainment is extraordinary. And but we were all brought up. Yeah, but Jay, you and I, I mean, all of these people uh, uh, in the current uh, base, you know, are, are brought up on this cowboy legend. And if you look at, at Gunsmoke, Marshall Dillon has no problem pulling that gun out, okay? There's no constraint. I mean, the, but they, they did have norms and they do have... They, they, they did have respect. And of course you had to be skillful because you had the six gun, six, six whatever, the, the, you know, the, the pistol gun. And, I, I uh, may not, have to give a second amendment perspective here, but go on. Okay, well, let me just, so anyway, I've just been looking at that and realizing 
I mean, there are a whole bunch of other issues that come right back up again. And this is my childhood theme from TV. Yeah, I mean, all of us, all of us so, have grown so, up in, in this environment. So, You're right. Yeah. And, and, and there are some people that can handle it, you know, that we're not yeah. going to go out in the street with guns and shoot people, but there are other people that can't control themselves. And yeah. for whatever psychological reason, um, the, uh, there's no guardrails for them. So they, they do yeah. these violent and lethal episodes. Tim, you wanted to add to that on the Second Amendment? Well, I'm just hearing a lot of bashing of the Second Amendment. That's okay, because I understand where that's coming from, because we're out of control. The United States is a violent society that is carried out with uh, weaponry that is far above any other place in the world. And so I understand the criticism of the Second Amendment. Um, very quickly, though, we have something in Hawaii, and I think most states, or a lot of states, it's called the Castle Doctrine, which is to say your castle is your personal, um, your personal haven, and you have the right to protect your family and, and anyone in that household. And I think that's the reason why a lot of people do own guns, is to preserve their, their castle doctrine. Remember, when there's a crime in the household, the police only respond after the crime. They're not there in time to prevent it. And I think that's the primary reason why a lot of people do own guns is to uh, provide at home protection. And I'll leave to it at that. The to kill their relatives because a lot <laughs> Well, okay, Thanksgiving doesn't always go well for people. I agree, Manfred. But well, let me not, say, you know, the old notion uh, that, you know, you could shoot anybody who came into your house, um, that, that's been eroded in this country. Well, not if, you, if you're going yeah. to shoot anybody who came into your house, no, you, you have to be under personal threat. You have to be under. You have to be threatened, and, and you fear might for your wind life. up going to jail for it. You yeah, know, you have to be in fear people. for your life. That is that's well, the defining the, the dividing line on that. You know, you uh, Manfred, know that I wanted to come to you about this. Um, so we have um, we're declining in terms of our control of the violence. Clearly, those stats I said around you know demonstrate something. Um, but, you know, what is what is problematic is that if there were a president like Trump, he would say, oh, there's crime, there's violence in the street. I have to meet that violence politically. I have to, you know, satisfy my base. So I'm going to send these guys out in unmarked uniforms with guns. I'm going to do the fascist thing. I'm going to shoot them down cold in the street. I'm going to take control. I'm going to use it as an excuse. And our friend Vladimir does the same thing. This is a, an autocratic mechanism, is it not? But remember, Trump said he could do anything. He could shoot someone in Manhattan and nobody would uh, be upset about it. So you have, to, I mean, that's the answer to your proposal. He, he in a way, suggested that. I'm talking about I'm talking about the larger 20th century. I'm talking about um, autocrats who use even minor amounts of violence to justify bringing in government um, violence and squashing. You know, like for example, the protests in in uh, in Shanghai that have been going on. Those guys are holding up uh, empty sheets of paper. That's not violent. Um, but Xi Jinping is sending in troops now, and they will be violent. Yeah, so but what's happening talking, is you get a cycle. Right, but we are distinguishing here between autocratic regimes like uh, the PRC and Russia and, uh, and others and uh, democratic societies like the U.S. And I think what is structurally so sickening about the U.S. is that they have, uh, you know, 400, more than 400 million guns in private hands. Uh, because of the Second Amendment. And whatever, you know, Tim said about the castle, the castle uh, contributes to the death toll as well. So uh, as long as this really, I wouldn't say mistake uh, of the founding fathers to have the Second Amendment, they put it in because they didn't want to have a standing army. And for that reason thought, you know, militias were a good, uh, well, so it's been, it's been well perverted since then. But we have a standing army in the U.S. since the Civil War. So they should have abolished the Second Amendment in 1865. But look, there is another issue that I find uh, we should talk about, and that's the 14th Amendment. And in the 14th Amendment, you know, you have uh, really the explanation 
why uh, these uh, insurrectionists were not charged, were not hanged. I mean, all the Southern, the leaders of the Southern uh, rebellion should have put, uh, they should have been shot or hanged uh, because they were insurrectionists. They were, uh, you know, overthrowing the, uh, the American order. So since then, you have this really bizarre uh, understanding, you know, that uh, these guys who tried to overthrow uh, the Republic were simply representatives of a lost cause. Well, what yeah, does that mean? Right. And, that, and that feeds on, on the kind of a First Amendment approach to it. And uh, frankly, that guy, Stuart Rhodes, uh, he didn't get enough time, as far as I'm concerned, and all his friends. Again, trying to overthrow the government, we got special, right. special we had results this, for him. We had this illustration in, in uh, 1860. Uh, but it goes beyond that, though. Vicky, I want to ask you about this. It goes beyond that. Um, the First Amendment gives, gives license, if you will. It excuses, as Manfred said, it ex excuses uh, conduct that really should not be tolerated at all. So here we have um, Trump gets embarrassed in the midterms. Um, he puts his hat in a ring. Um, people are condemning him for mm, anti-Semitic remarks and the like over the past. And yet, and yet this violence continues. And I suggest to you, I like your opinion, I suggest to you that it doesn't matter what Trump does anymore, that the, this has all been unleashed in our country, that these episodes will continue that we are in a, a new kind, a new model of civil war, which is violence, not on the street corner, but anywhere at all. Uh, your thoughts, please, on that possibility. I think you're right. And uh, he has fueled now this, this uh, mo movement from people. And I think it all starts with people who feel that the country, they don't dominate the country like they used to. They're the ones who call out against immigrants taking their jobs. They feel this sense of insecurity, you know, and so in their own twisted way, they're taking control back at all costs by any means. This is how they justify it. And that's very dangerous. But I have one question to ask, and that is as a start, can we not get a ban on assault weapons across the board other than for military use or, you know, uh, police? But why do we even have that in the hands of private citizens? Well, let me let me just make a quick call to Mitch McConnell. Uh, Mitch, are you there? <laughs> Maybe Mitch has an answer for you, Vicky. I don't think that our founding fathers even thought that that would be acceptable, really. That is to me so something that should be tackled as a very big first step and a necessary one. And I just, I don't understand why that can't be you know, done. You know, it's, it's, it's really ironic. When I was a kid, I had a 22. We went out and terrible, I hate to admit it in public, we went and shot squirrels is what we did. Okay, mm -hmm. can you imagine taking a assault, assault rifle out into those same woods and shooting squirrels <laughs> it's all right it's so absurd you really need an assault rifle do you so stephanie let me let me go to you and, and i saved the hardest question of all for our um you know for our discussion for you stephanie um what do we do what do we do well are we talking about you're talking about you know assault rifles and the second amendment but we're also talking about these nutcases um, you know, who, who have a bad day, wind up killing people in great numbers. What do we do about that? Is, well, don't I think tell me it's mental health. It's well, much I, more than that. That's what I was going to bring up is because you said that cases, and I've noticed that pervading all of this is uh, the overlay of mental health over anybody that shoots anybody has got a mental health problem. Well, the, I just don't see how that that holds any water at all. And I, I haven't heard the, the APA or the psychiatrist or the psychologists um, speaking out uh, on this issue. And um, uh, but it is permeating more of the discussions is that we need more money for mental health, including in the New York situation, going after these homeless people who have actually mental health uh, diagnoses. And so we have a place to start. So I think we need to get a grip on how, how we're 
slicing and dicing this thing uh, according to the factors and get get them uh, under control because uh, that one is taking over and we need to go back to the personal responsibility. Yeah, I'm not sure that mental health is the answer. I mean, when I, when I was a kid, I was offended by the defense that some criminal defendants would make is I had a rough childhood. You know, I don't care about your childhood. I care about what you're doing now. <laughs> but there's another, Jay, there's another issue that I think that we have not talked about. And that's the gender issue that you have white males feeling threatened by the transformation, the major transformation of American society. They are losing the power and they do not know how to handle that. Uh, I mean, when you're looking at the new leadership in the House of the Democratic you're, Party. You're not going to tell me that an assault rifle is a phallic symbol, are you? Well, maybe it is. Uh, <laughs> but no, but I think. I think you have this replacement ideology taking root in America that the white majority will be replaced by 2040 or a little bit later by a different majority. And when you're looking at the new leadership of the Democrats in the House, you know, you have a black person and uh, you have an Hispanic and a white woman. The white male is not any longer at the center. And I think what you have as a dynamic for a lot of this violence, this guy there in, in Buffalo, you know, who targeted only black people, he targeted them because he was admittedly a racist. He was against black people. And I think you have to understand that what is really uh, becoming an issue in, in the U.S. is this gender-based white, anti-Black, anti-Asian, anti-Hispanic racism. Uh, for some strange reason, you know, uh, it is a new version of traditional American racism. I mean, America was founded in 1780. Uh, Nine, uh, on the basis of slavery. The political economy of uh, the Republic was based on the um, enslavement of 18% of the people living then in the US. And, you know, this issue has never been dealt with in, in, a, in a rational way and has, I mean, people try to avoid talking uh, about it, you know, for that reason, I think uh, we have to do a lot of teaching. You know, Manfred, uh, we we had a uh, we had a, a show yesterday involving Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass lived from 1788 to sometime in the late 19th century. Right, um, and he was a, he was a black abolitionist. He very smart, articulate guy, and he said the same things you're saying. Um, and he and he was uh, making speeches uh, a, a dozen years before the Civil War, seeing it coming, trying to head it off, right, right. talking about racism and the need for equality and diversity and all that. And um, what what he was saying then, a hundred and what fifty years ago, is the same thing we're saying now. We're stuck in amber. We really haven't advanced, or at least a lot of us, millions of us. Have not advanced. But let me but go to Vicky. There is a change going on that I think. Well, that's I want to ask Vicky about that. Vicky, you know, we have now a black leader um, in in the House, or at least a minority leader in the House. That's good, and and we have a lot of women, um, you know, in in government uh, as as perhaps never before, and um, we have minorities. We have diversity in Congress. Some of them more competent and moderate than others, but we have them, and and they're getting elected. Uh, like you know, the, the racists or not, they're getting elected. Is this a solution, okay, to uh, the replacement problem that Manfred talks about? I think what Mr. Manfred said is spot on. What you said about uh, the discussion on Frederick D Douglass is spot on, and I think honestly, this whole. Uh, 
start of these feelings started even before Trump. I think it started when President Obama was elected. I think a good number in our country will not, did not, and would not accept an African American as their president. You can rise up to be a little bit of a manager. You cannot be the number one. And this is a challenge we face, you know, gender, race differences. I don't know the answer to that, but I think we have got to tackle gun control. Take, I think that will have an impact on the kind of gun violence that you're seeing as a step. We can't just talk about it, but I don't think that having this representation is, is going to calm things down. I think it'll just add fuel to that segment, in the community that's angrier than ever. I do think that if the Republicans have some kind of common sense to have a representative other than Donald, Donald Trump, who is not as much of a, a radical or a lunatic, that may bring people to a more moderate position and we could start the conversation again. Well, that takes me to Tim. Tim, so DeSantis, Ron DeSantis is a possibility for 2024. And if Trump keeps uh, stepping on his own tie, um, you know, it may happen. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I believe he's capable of resurrecting himself. He's done that before. Hitler did that before. Come out of jail and, and then, you know, become the national Fuhrer. Um, so I guess the question I put to you is, that, is it better under DeSantis? Would DeSantis be a solution to all this violence? Um, would he, will he calm, you know, the nerves of the racists? Or would he exacerbate the racism? Oh, I, I think there's a lot of room left for the MAGA concept. Remember, MAGA, Make America Great Again, is really just a dog whistle to white males that uh, you've been pushed and shoved to the back of the room, and it's time to get back to the front of the room. And so I think DeSantis or any, any politician that wants to glom onto power will use that as an effective tool. And I don't think it goes away with Donald Trump. Donald Trump has released MAGA and the MAGA concept, and that's not going away. So uh, DeSantis will, I think, will continue on with it and even, even hone in on that uh, and, and refine it more. And it, it will serve him well politically. Yeah. So Manfred, you know, we, we, we touched on the sides of uh, what happened in Europe in the 30s uh, and how violence became um, a kind of political tool, uh, and it still is among autocrats and dictators everywhere. Um, where are we going globally? And, and what is the exchange relationship with the phenomena that we've been talking about in the United States uh, and in these other places. You want to have a protest, we're going to fix your wagon kind of thing. And, and we'll, we'll put you down, put you in jail, we'll beat you up, we'll kill you, whatever, um, as in Russia. Um, what is the relationship? Why? Is, is this part of climate change? What is it? No, no. I mean, look, you have this replacement ideology popping up in some countries in Europe. You have it in Hungary. Strangely enough, you have it had, or you have it also in some Scandinavian countries, in Sweden and Denmark and Norway. Uh, but uh, I think in the United States, this issue will become worse the closer we come to the change of the ethnic majority. You know, uh, so that's what Vicky was saying. <laughs> unless you know, once. We have reached that point. Uh, I think we will see more of this uh, white male uh, anger manifest itself. But in a way, you could say it's also a hopeful sign, because uh, one of the interesting results of the midterms was that, contrary to popular belief, young people of all colors voted in greater numbers than ever before. And if, for some reason, you know, these young people do not buy into this white supremacy ideology that the older male population in the United States does. And you have the same phenomenon, by the way, in Germany, you know, because most Americans do not know that 25% uh, of Germans today have a migrant background. 
So you have, uh, you know, an ethnic diversity in the center of Europe, you know, uh, that is quite extraordinary. Yeah, Europe has changed. It well, has changed in the past few years. I have a movie for you guys to watch. Well, it's but look, the, the, the swimmers. Europe, Europe make has, a note of that, the swimmers. It's about migration into Germany today. Yeah, but some have not, you know, what bothers me sometimes, you know, my name, Henningsen, has a Danish uh, background. And when I go to Denmark, you know, and when I go to Sweden, what you have there is right wing uh, racism spreading the end. I mean, and you have also to remember that the Brexit had to do with a lot of that and the story of Megan, you know, uh, being not liked by other members in the royal household uh, it was a very, very powerful motivation for Megan and Harry to move to the United States. So what is it? What, what explains this, ha this phenomenon happening all over the place? Is it, is it the, the water? Is it uh, some effect of climate change? What is it? <laughs> um, you know what it is. It's, <laughs> it's pure racism. OK. Well, we have an attack. That's it. And we have a viral racism. So Stephanie, you know, we talk about, we all talk about, let's get another generation in here. Let's have diversity. Um, there's a certain concern that may exacerbate that, that that may exacerbate, you know, the racism and the, you know replacement Temporary, problem. Yes. But 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 Stephanie, what about the old guys? Um, what is their role? Should oh. should Manfred run for office? Yes. Should I run for office, oh. Tim? Um, uh, oh. You know, Vicky Vicky's already done that. She may do that again. <laughs> but what is the role of the older people? Um, you know, who are not necessarily in that 25 year old group. Mm -hmm. uh, what can they do about this? Because in a funny way, they may be part of the solution, at least part. A lot, um, unarguably, and in appreciation, males, white males, European males of the world have built civilizations and have contributed greatly and have also taken all the power everywhere they could. But they are now uh, in position of moving back. I mean, they have no choice, but the changes are now impinging upon their power structures and even their contributions. And I think that that's where there's some difficulty here is that these uh, in our country, European males, they have been the leaders. I mean, they have taken us where we are now, but now they're starting to tear it apart and it's time for them to step up and move us into how we know to live together and to solve problems in ways that, that they've learned from their corporate well, presumably they have a little wisdom a little wisdom they, um, yes and they need to bring that and put the guns aside and start operating in a 21st 22nd century manner we've got to move off the violent go to war thing there is no war to go to it's nuclear <laughs> disaster Okay, so these guys, as they have contributed throughout time, need to take it on again. It'll be a little different because they don't get to be emperor, king, and prince, and I've got it all myself. Well, some they have, have they, they, they share it. I do appreciate that. As a female, I do appreciate that the males have had to to give on this, and and they're get they're getting with it. Some of them are, okay. but it's all changing. And the best thing they can do is what they've always done, which is this tremendous. Uh, a capacity to reinvent the world, build civilization, and take us to the next the next levels. Okay, Vicky, world. You know, do you agree with Stephanie? Would you like to rebut anything about that? I'm talking to Vicky. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I would just remind everyone that yes, acknowledge what they've done, but they couldn't have done it without all those on the backs of the immigrants, of the women who did so much and never got any credit. And that is a fact as well. But I agree with you, balance, acknowledgement, you know, that kind of bigger picture rather than this narrow-minded, we want to get only for us mentality will serve to bring us more peace. Oh God, that is so true. That is profoundly true. Um, hey, uh, can, we, can we go around for final comments now, Tim? Would you um, like to go first or would you sure. we have a I'd comment about first. what we've been talking about? 
I'd love to go first, because as we talk about male repla white male replacement, we have to talk about insecurity. And what is insecurity for a white male? It's the, the provider mentality that since the caveman days, that the white male was the provider or the male is the provider. And now we're going to make a causal connection, or we ought to make a causal connection between economic insecurity and racism or white male replacement, because they go hand in hand. Um, and so we're dealing with thousands of years of mentality and it's got to be addressed somehow, some way, because Vicki and, and Manford are, are correct. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. Demographics don't lie. And it's, we got to address it before it becomes even more problematic as far as violence in our society. Ooh, ooh, we're really hitting some good points here. Um, you know, Manfred, I'm, I'm thinking that there may be a common denominator in uncertainty, uncertainty about the future uncertainty about whether you can feed your family, uncertainty about the, the political stability of your jurisdiction. You think that might be, I'm, I'm really asking for your summary comments here, but do you think that might be a common denominator? Look, <laughs> Stephanie said, you know, white males should change. It, it's, it's very interesting. You know, I, I got married in 74 to a young black American woman. And when we, in 75, went for the first time uh, to Germany, I was stunned by the response, the acceptance, uh, the delight, you know, that people uh, showed us. But in 1990, we went to East Germany. And there we were looked at as an exotic, uh, example of what uh, really should not happen. The East Germans had not had the experiences the West German had. You know, there were three and a half million black soldiers from 1945 to 1990 stationed in Germany. And they had a wonderful experience also because they lived in a white country where they didn't have, uh, you know, colored bathrooms and uh, all kinds of other things that they knew from the South. So Germany was not segregated, but these black soldiers were sent to Germany to cure Germans of racism. And they didn't know what that really meant for them. Colin Powell has written about that in his memoirs because he was one of them. So when I look at Germany today, it is a really radically changed country and uh, for that reason, you know, I am, when I'm looking at the midterms in the U.S., I see the U.S. Uh, as a troubled, but as a changing country, positively changing country. So for that reason, I'm not as pessimistic as I was before the midterms. And whatever happens, you know, in DeSantis' minds or in Trump's mind, uh, still disturbs me, but I am not any longer as troubled as I was before. America has a, a future that is not as sick as I thought it was. Okay, all right, wow. We're really hitting some good points. Uh, Vicki, let me, let me repeat the one question I would be interested in hearing from you about. And, and of course, you summarize any way you want, but uh, you think uncertainty is nervousness about the future, about the, you know, the, the future of, of the economies, or, ability to earn a living, get a fair deal, uh, is part of the malaise that we have? Yes, and I think that the world is changing, businesses are changing. It is tough for a middle-aged white person who's been doing things a certain way to, to adapt. And I think you've got to recognize that with some empathy before we you know, go on a rampage like they're doing. But having said that, there is no doubt this difficulty to to bridge together their defiant position that they will not accept leaders who are of color or who are women i think that's going to be very difficult i think really we just hold it together so that the next generation can lead uh with better judgment and decisions i, I think for this generation our generation we just got to try to keep it all together before it it explodes on us uh, literally and you know stephanie um, you've had time in education and you you must put yourself in the school um, as a teacher or an administrator in a school, in Uvali, for example. 
And you see these guys burst in the door or some loner burst in the door with an, an assault weapon and you, you know your, your moments are numbered. What is your philosophical reaction to that risk? Uh, horror. Uh, that would be the end of the game. I, it's hard. It's horror. So uh, what we have to do goes back to a, a point I was trying to make that we know so much more now, um, and especially males because of their leadership roles, and how to problem solve, and how to decide on policies that will keep us safe and protect us and move off of these power structures and domains and and um and and this fierceness of opposition that that permeates our politics we know how i mean how do we get to the moon i mean how do we go to mars i mean we know how to do these things and to bring people into situations that are very complicated and socially complicated as well and we bring all these best minds to those so we need to, that to proliferate so that we have these problems um on, on in hand and and in treatment as they should be whoever that person coming in the door okay yeah. for our final comment here let me let me just ask mitch what he thinks uh mitch are you there <laughs> mcconnell <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's Mitch not, not knows how to help. Mitch knows how to think well, through complicated well, things. Despite the difficulty of the subject today, I, I compliment you all on reaching new issues, profound issues, philosophical issues, issues that really have a chance at uh, understanding and succeeding here. Uh, Tim Apicella, Manfred Henningsen, Vicky Caetano, and of course, Stephanie Stoltalton. Thank you so much, all of you. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.